Yo. <laughs> okay, he's got to check and see who's here. Mike Gold, where are you? Thank you for letting me be here, bud. I appreciate it. Sitting ne right next to the superintendent, by the way, is my wife, Betty. Betty, would you stand up real quick? <laughs> She's a babe. <laughs> <laughs> Right next to Betty are my great, great friends and really my family members, Glenn Pollock and his wife Regan, and a lot of other great Americans sitting in the middle row. Mike, thanks for the opportunity to be here. Rich Clark, get your chin in. <laughs> Harpo, thanks for the work you're doing here. Dana, thank you for allowing me to visit with you this morning. It was an honor as always. And Dr. Mew, you'll always be a chemistry professor to me, and you scare me to death. <laughs> it's great to see you again, my friend. Thank you for the members of the faculty who are here. Uh, most importantly, thank you to the members of the cadet wing who are here. Thank you for volunteering for this session. <laughs> <laughs> this picture has absolutely nothing to do with what I'm going to talk about, but it reminds me that I was cool once. <laughs> now I'm just old and dumpy. <laughs> Makes me seem like a loser, doesn't it? <laughs> And you're stuck with me for the next 45 minutes. <laughs> Don't clap yet. I might suck. <laughs> next slide, please. One of the things that's cool about coming back to the Air Force Academy is that I'm always reminded of things that I didn't appreciate when I was a cadet. Don't take this as a lecture. Take this as a suggestion. Places like the Honor Court. Have you ever been up there in the evening when nobody else is around? You don't have to answer this. If you haven't, go there then, not when all those old guys are crying during the award ceremonies and opening of new plaques, because you won't really understand that unless you go there alone. And stand next to this B-20 or B-17 model here and look back over your shoulder at that P-40 and put your hand on the marble and close your eyes. Strange things happen. You'll hear the bogey calls. Then you'll hear the bandit calls. You'll hear the waste gunners testing their guns. You'll sense the tension as they anticipate the attack. You'll sense the fear. And you'll feel the pride. This is a magic place. Give it a try. Next slide. Here's another magic place that I never really appreciated. You walk by it every day. Right there by the flagpole. Sometimes just walk up to it when nobody's around and just stare into the stone. Put your hand on it. And then send me an email and tell me you felt like you were alone. Because you won't. First time I did this, when I moved my hand, there was a name there I'd never seen before. It was Robert Lodge. Anybody heard of him? Next slide. I went and looked him up. There he is. Good looking dually, huh? M mature, charismatic, two degree. And then the right hand picture of him as a captain. Robert Lodge is a member of the class of 64. He graduated from second squadron, which I got the chance to visit this morning. Next slide. Before he died on the second combat tour, Robert Lodge earned five silver stars seven distinguished flying crosses and 37 air medals, along with a Purple Heart. He shot down his last of his three MiGs on the day that Steve Ritchie shot down his first. Ritchie was one of the wingmen in Robert Lodge's foreship. Unfortunately, as he attacked a MiG-21 to try and get it off the butt of one of his flight mates, a MiG-19 joined the fight and shot him down. His backseater got out, but he didn't. Robert Lodge is part of your Air Force heritage. Why don't we know about him? Visit the wall. Pick a name. Learn something about who you are. Next slide. You probably don't know these guys either. These are airmen. They're not US airmen. And they don't fly a lot, except to get to the target. But they're really good at what they do. How many of you in the last seven days have said, this place sucks? 
Tell me the truth, there's still the honor code. Could be a lot worse. These guys could be looking for you. <laughs> you know, when people hear that these guys are airmen, they think, man, warfare's changed. Next slide, please. It has changed. Let me run a video that many of you have probably seen, but before I run it, let me talk to you about it. This is an F-16 sortie. It's in Ramadi, Iraq, probably seven, eight years ago. The F-16 pilot's on station to support a special operator on the ground who's lazing a target for him. The target's just above that gun cross. It's the, uh, the big square building because there's a meeting of militant leaderships going on in there in the middle of Ramadi that was reported by a CIA source. And we're gonna take it out. Now, as you start to hear the conversation between the soldier on the ground and the guy in the air, you'll hear him talk about a group of civilians who comes out of that building, turns on that road, going down to the bottom of the picture. They're heading to reinforce a gunfight going on with U.S. Army soldiers down to the south. Let's run the video. See the people coming out of the, the down the road? Take those out. Take them out. Now, I don't know those people. They're bad guys. The guy on the ground knows that. They're also brothers and fathers and husbands and sons, next door neighbors, friends and family members. 10 seconds. Only other thing I know about them is that they have about eight seconds to live. Yeah, oh dude. Every now and then remind yourself about why you're here, why you're really here, why you wear these things. You're joining the profession of arms. Your job will be an ugly one. There's nothing pretty about what you just saw. There's nothing glorious about it. There's nothing cool about it. It's ugly. but somebody's got to be good at it. Mike Gould is. Harpo Clark is. I am. You better be. This is where you get ready. Next slide. You know, warfare may be changing, but let's run the video, Fred. Some things don't. La muerte en directo se ha convertido en una imagen cotidiana allí. Esto ha ocurrido en el, sub en el suburbio Bagdadí, controlado por las milicias del clérigo radical al -Sahar. Except for the way they killed him, I don't think this scene looks much different than it would have looked a thousand years ago. Next slide. This picture was taken in Afghanistan in 2002. It's an Air Force Master Sergeant named Bart Decker, who's now retired. He's an Air Force combat controller. And he went into Afghanistan with the first Army Special Forces teams to work with the Northern Alliance and fight the Taliban. This warfare is changing. Technology's taken over. We've all heard that, right? Bart Decker's a new age kind of guy. He understands technology. And he's got a boatload of it on that horse. But the most sophisticated piece of warfighting equipment in this picture is Bart Decker. And he really hasn't changed that much since the days of the Roman Legion. Politics are going to change. Technology is going to change. The enemy will change. Next slide, Fred. But they won't. You know, our nation gives us its, its sons and daughters. And it commits us to defending the nation and its interests and it expects us to be successful. These are the people who do that. Your job will be to lead them. That's what you signed up for. Are you ready? Next slide. The guy in the second row center of this picture 
with a hand on his shoulder, is Zach Davis. This is taken when he was a member of the Corps of Cadets at Texas A&M University. The guy on his left and right have their hands on his shoulders to keep him aligned and spaced because Zach Davis is completely blind. Has been since he was a little kid. But he grew up listening to a tape of the Fighting Texas Aggie Band. And it inspired him. And he wanted to wear the uniform of our country in some way, shape, or form. And he wanted to serve something greater than himself. And so he wrote a letter to the Commandant of Cadets at Texas A&M University, and he asked to be included in the Corps. And the Commandant, to his great credit, accepted him. He knew he couldn't serve in the Army or the Marine Corps or the Air Force or the Navy when he graduated, but he worried about all the same things that those who were going to did. When I first met Zach and talked to him, he told me there were three things he worried about all the time. The first was, what did the future hold after he graduated? What am I going to do? The second one was, will I make a difference? And the third one was, what are they going to expect of me in whatever career field I go into? I've never forgotten that because those were the three things I worried about when I was sitting out there in this auditorium as a cadet. And I suspect they're the same three things some of you think about here. So let me talk about those three things. Next slide. First, let me talk about your future. And start by telling you you have absolutely no idea what's going to happen in it. Some of you have these goals and dreams you've had your whole life and you'll achieve them. Others have goals and dreams you've had your whole life and you're not even going to come close. Or life will happen and you'll end up having to divert and develop a whole new set of goals and dreams and you'll succeed more wildly than you thought possible. The guy on the left in this picture is my son, John. He's a graduate of the class of 2003 here at the Air Force Academy. Went to pilot training, got an F-16 out of training, which was his lifetime dream. When he was in fighter lead-in, John developed a condition called Meniere's disease. It's an inner ear disorder. He was medically grounded and then medically discharged. Big kick in the teeth for John. May of next year, John will graduate from medical school. He'll go on to a residency in orthopedic trauma surgery. He's got a new dream, and he's chasing it at 1,000 miles an hour, just like you're going to do. Next slide. Mike there in the center just got out of the Air Force Academy. He's an armament flight commander at RAF Lake and Ethan in the UK. He's got 56 airmen working for him. And they love him. Some of you knew him. Next slide. Kay's the director of public affairs at Ramstein Air Base in Germany. She informs 54,000 Department of Defense people in the Kaiserslautern military area every single day. She's been on the job for about four months. Next slide. Dan's a maintenance officer. Spangdalem Air Base in Germany. His flight was spectacular in the buildup for Operation Odyssey Dawn. He was a hero. He's now been accepted in the Special Operations career field. He'll switch next spring and get his beret in May. Next slide. Sean is the acting comptroller at the 501st Combat Support Wing in Alconbury, England. He is the principal financial advisor to the wing commander. He's got 20 people working for him on four different installations. He is the man when it comes to money and finance for that wing. Next slide. Nicole is at Ramstein Air Base in Germany. She's in the vehicle readiness squad, and she runs the largest vehicle fleet in Europe, over 2,000 different types of vehicles, or 2,000 different vehicles of many, many different types. Next slide. Torrance Communications and Cyber Officer. He has 260 people working for him, civilians and military. He runs a network worth $54 million with 22,000 users. When operations in Libya began, he was the one responsible for putting together the command and control net for air operations. He led the effort. Next slide. Okay, he's a C-130J pilot at Ramstein. She's flown all over Europe and Africa. She hauled, to, uh, he, she hauled Libyan refugees out of Tunisia, took them back to Egypt before Odyssey Dawn began. She just got back from sitting on a static display at the Moscow Air Show. Next slide. Jason's a weatherman. He works for U.S. Army Africa staff. He's worked on three different joint task forces already in his career. Next slide. 
Mike won the Jabbar Award for Airmanship last year. His roommate from the Academy won it the year before. Next slide. Nasty Hickey left here and got a... <laughs> He's probably proud of that name. <laughs> Not. <laughs> he left here and went to MIT. Got a degree, master's degree in logistics. Then he went to F-16 school. Now he's got 1,000 hours in the F-16. 400 of them are in combat. He's also an Olmsted Scholar this next year. Next slide. Amy works for me on my command action group. As a lieutenant, she worked at the National Security Agency. She was credited with helping in the seizure of $40 billion worth of contraband in the drug business. She's also been on the All Air Force soccer team six times, on the All Armed Forces soccer team six times, and was the captain of the All Armed Services team at the World Games in Brazil this last year. Next slide. And the doc is fully qualified in three different specialties, and he's been the traveling physician for both the Chief of Staff of the Air Force and Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld. Next slide. There are you. The names and faces are going to change, but this is what you're going to be doing. This and so much more. By the way, when you look at this picture, anything strike you? They got anything in common? Yeah, they're all smiling. They don't think where they are sucks. <laughs> and by the way, if you ask them now, because I have, do you think the academy sucked? Because I know you said it when you were there. They all laugh and say no. So what do you think changed? The academy or them? I'll leave you to chew on that for a few minutes. Next slide. I didn't introduce the other guy in this picture to you a minute ago. That's my dad. His name's Mick Welsh. Probably the proudest day in his life when he pinned those wings on his grandson. I don't know which one of the two is prouder in this picture, but the proudest guy in the area was the guy taking the picture. My dad had been out of the Air Force for 30 years when John asked him to pin his wings on him. He ordered a new set of Class A's. He ordered a new ribbon rack. He polished the silver insignia because his are all silver. They're not chrome. This was a big event for him. A couple of years ago, three years ago, my dad died, and when he died, he left us a, a, the word that in his safety deposit box. He had a book that told everything we needed to do after he died. So we went there to the bank, and we, we got the book out, and it actually was a book. And he titled it. It was called The Croak Book. <laughs> <laughs> you don't like my dad. And one of the things in there it said is, bury me in my uniform, that uniform. So we did. While he wore that on active duty, my dad served for 35 years. He fought in three wars. He had over 9,000 hours of flying time, and about 8,000 hours of those were in fighters, which is unheard of today. He flew with the forerunners of the Thunderbirds, a group called the Acrojets in Germany. He towed a glider across the English Channel on D-Day. He flew a glider into Germany on the largest glider assault in history across the Rhine River, and then he fought with the infantry for four months after they landed. He wore the Silver Star, five Distinguished Flying Crosses, more Air Medals than I care to count. He was nominated for the Congressional Medal of Honor one time for a mission in Vietnam. My dad made a difference. And so will you. Next slide. Jared's a cop, Ramstein Air Base in Germany. When our two airmen were gunned down by that spineless guy at the Frankfurt airport earlier this year, and two others critically wounded, Jared was the first American on scene. He led a security forces response team that took control of the site, secured the area, coordinated with the German Bundeswehr police, with the German counterterrorism police, with the OSI, the CID, the State Department, and the Secret Service. As the on-scene commander, he put together the reports that went all the way to President Obama on what was going on. He was also responsible for the security for the two survivors who were taken to a nearby hospital. Next slide. 
Chex is meeting his wife after deployment to Afghanistan here. Chex is credited for three different times in Afghanistan, saving 20 to 50 soldiers and special operators' lives on the ground by attacking with an F-16 at the right time and putting bombs on target. Next slide. Neil's the guy on the right. Neil led 72 convoys in Afghanistan as, combat, as convoy commander, 72. He's never lost a person or a vehicle. That is an unbelievable record. Next slide. By the way, he's a comm officer. Alyssa is a physical therapist. In fact, she was the Air Combat Command and the USAFE Physical Therapist of the Year at different times. She's also a distinguished honor graduate of the US Army Air Assault School. She's treated over 15,000 patients in her career so far, including multiple wounded warriors, which has kind of become her specialty. She's also been on the All Air Force Cross Country and Marathon team six times. Next slide. He's a biological engineer. You heard Operation Tomodachi in Japan, the tsunami followed by the radiological disaster when the nuke plant was affected. That was the first humanitarian disaster relief effort done under radiological contaminated conditions. First time. The principal advisor to the commander of US Pacific Command, the commander of Pacific Air Forces, and the fifth Air Force commander in Japan during that activity was Lieutenant Keith Sanders. Next slide. Janae Jackson's on her right. She's a flight nurse. And her job currently in a Ramstein Air Base in Germany, she has flown 43 evacuation flights back to the States with critical care patients, over 565 of them, bringing them to life-saving care in the States. The guy with her is her brother, Nat, also class of 2003. He's a KC-135 pilot but in uh, McCord Air Base in Washington. He has almost 2,000 hours of combat time. He's deployed 10 times. Next slide. You've heard these names. Joe Helton volunteered to stay six months beyond the end of his tour in Afghanistan so he could finish with the team he trained of the Iraqi police. A month after that decision, he was killed by an IED. Jeremy Frescos was a special tactics officer. He was killed on May 30, 2005 in Diyala province. Right beside him, fighting and dying that day, was another classmate of his named Derek Argel, who crossed commission to the Navy and was a Navy SEAL. They're still wrestling together. Dave Wisniewski was on his third, his third flight into a hot LZ to pull British soldiers off the battlefield, wounded British soldiers off the battlefield, when an RPG hit his helicopter and it crashed. Four airmen were killed and three were terribly wounded. Dave was one of the three wounded. He died about three weeks later in Bethesda Hospital in Maryland. And I think you know that Rosalind Schulte was the first Academy graduate female to be killed by an enemy combatant. What you may not know is that she was an intelligence officer. Her job was teaching Iraqi military officials, or excuse me, Afghan military officials, how to collect and interpret intelligence. That job made her a target. And she was killed outside of Kabul by an IED. These people made a difference. Everybody I just talked about is making a difference. And you will too. Don't worry about that. Next slide. After that day where you smoke cigars, lay on the grass, chest bump the president, and make a fool out of yourself on national TV, <laughs> you're going to come out and work with the rest of us. Let me tell you what we expect. Next slide. We expect you to be credible, not like that guy, but like number 35. That's my son, Matt. See, when you get me, you get the whole family. This is an eight, nine-year-old basketball team called the Lakers. I'm coaching it because Matt was a seven-year-old, and I didn't want him to play with six and seven-year-olds because he's always been about two bubbles off center and I was afraid he'd hurt somebody. So I thought eight, nine-year-olds, a lot bigger, we'll be safer. The guy in the back row there, number 33, is Thomas. Thomas's dad called me after we had tryouts and we had the team set, and he said, hey, uh, 
the league chairman said, maybe I could have my son play on your team. And I said, okay, this sounds a little fishy. Tell me about Thomas. So he told me how tall he was, and I went, hmm? That would be a good thing. And then he told me he had attention deficit disorder. I mean, he really had ADD. But I met Thomas. He's a great kid, so I said, sure, I'd love to have him on the team. Well, Thomas was a horrible basketball player. I mean, he, they called him Bunny, which was short for Energizer Bunny. I mean, every time he'd get the ball, he'd start vibrating. So he'd do this, and eventually he'd just vibrate in a traveling call, and we'd go play defense. <laughs> it happened that way all year long. Right before the first game of the season, at the end of practice, Thomas came up to me. It's a Thursday night. We're playing Saturday. And he said, Coach, uh, can, I, can I talk to the guys? Sure, Thomas. Inspire us. <laughs> so, he, so we gathered the team around, and Thomas tells him the story. He tells me how he got his nickname. Turns out Thomas is the only guy on our team who wasn't from the same elementary school. He'd come from another school. The reason he'd moved is because he couldn't play with the kids from his own school because they made fun of him all the time, and they did. The big scorer on the team we were playing Saturday, kind of the league star, is the one who gave him the nickname Bunny, which was actually a pretty good nickname. But Thomas just poured out his heart to the team about how these guys pick on him at school all day. He tries hard to ignore it, but he knows it'll happen again during the game. And he just wanted the team to know that he probably wouldn't play very well on Saturday, which I think they knew anyway. <laughs> <laughs> But it was kind of cool. What was really cool is when he was done, Matt stood up and put his arm around his, his, about his waist, which is where he could reach. He says, don't worry, Thomas. They won't say anything to you with me around. <laughs> That's my boy. <laughs> Saturday rolls around. We're doing the layup line. Thomas has his usual, you know, he whiffs everything with a layup. He doesn't even get glass, twine, nothing. Some kid from the other end yells, hey, look at Bunny shoot. Matt peels out of our layup line and screams at him, you better shut up. I grab Matt and throw him back in line. <laughs> we get ready to start the game. I send Thomas out to start. I want him to jump center. I thought I'd give him a little street cred with his peeps. <laughs> so he's, so he, he heads out there kind of vibrating, you know, doing the, into the circle. And of course, not knowing that the kid who has picks on him all the time is going to jump against him. So a bad move by the coach. And as he walks out there, this kid looks at Thomas, starts laughing, turns to one of the other kids on, the, on his team. He says, hey, look at Bunny vibrate. And Matt went Rambo on him. <laughs> he took him out. He took him down. He's flailing. He's pounding on him. Right there in the middle of the circle. The referee's got the ball in his hand going, <laughs> what do I do with this? Finally, he drops the ball, picks up Matt, and he kind of walks over, and I grab him. Matt's still screaming. I throw him on the end of the bench. We haven't started our first game of the year, and my son's already thrown out. <laughs> it was a horrible moment for Betty and I. Anyway, things calm down. Game gets ready to restart. The kid on the other team still got a little blood on his lip, but he's doing okay. He's back out on the floor, and Thomas now comes walking out, like John Wayne. <laughs> And he steps in front of the guy, and he points over at Matt, on the, who's on the bench, and he says, he's still right there. <laughs> <laughs> Matt has credibility. Still does, by the way. If he says that he means it. If he tells you he's going to kick your butt, you got a decision to make. Because he's going to try. You need to have that kind of credibility when you leave here. You need to develop it here. When you tell your airman later that you're going to do something for him, you better do it. If you tell him you're going to follow up on an action for him, you better follow up. If you tell him you're going to look into something for their family, you better look into it. Folks, you get one chance. One chance. Get ready. Next slide. We talk here a lot about attention to detail. I know you do. You do these here all the time. You guys are trying to train them. People told you the same thing. Most of the time you're going, why does this matter? You know, the fact that your socks are rolled a certain way isn't what matters. It's the fact that you pay attention to detail. These are my buddies. They're Mike Gould's buddies. Magoo is Mike McGuire. 
Mike McGuire died in an F4 accident. Got a little distracted doing a nuclear bomb toss, rolled over, and as he started to pull, he kind of drifted the nose low, watching the bomb probably, not paying attention. He hit the ground going real fast. The board decided that if he had started to roll and pull 0.2 seconds earlier, he might have lived. 0.2 seconds. Dave Meyer was flying his number four in an A7 flight in Turkey. We called him Yamu because it means little mountain, supposedly, in Japanese, and he was a big boy. He played O-line on the football team. One of the nicest human beings I've ever met. He went lost wingman when his flight went above the weather for a weather abort. Nobody really understand why, understood why he went lost wingman. They just realized later he flew almost straight ahead, probably looking up in the air for his flight because he couldn't hear him on the radio and flew into the ground. In the investigation, they determined that his volume knob and his radio had been turned down probably when he bumped it with his glove, reaching for a switch nearby. Seems like such a little thing, doesn't it? John Vosberg was flying 22 feet low on a low-level route in Korea. He was certified to 100 feet. He was about 22 feet. Didn't have a radar altimeter. Hard to tell 22 feet. Unfortunately, there was a new cable that had been strung at 78 feet above the ground. And when he turned into the sun, another minor mistake, and because of the glare, couldn't see it. It hit his OV-10, and it disintegrated in midair. Chico Lavelle was crouched on the front seat of his F-4 at Nellis Air Force Base, waiting to do a ground egress because they had a fire behind him. Somehow, he and the backseater had gotten the terminology confused, and when one of them said, get out, the other guy thought he meant bail out, and ejected him. And he was decapitated by the canopy rail. Attention to detail. Is it important? You decide. But when you leave here, you better have it. Next slide. You better be ready to make decisions as well. First Gulf War, I was flying an A-10 or an F-16 mission, the uh, first day of the ground war. A bunch of us were up on a common strike frequency, and a guy named Bill Andrews was shot down right in the middle of the retreating Republican Guard Armor Division. Strike controller came up on the frequency and said, we got an F-16 down. Here's the coordinates. So everybody's looking at their map trying to figure out where this was. I need anybody with the weapons and fuel to support a search and rescue effort to call back. And as I'm looking at these coordinates, looking at my map, I was doing the same thing everybody else in the air was going, which is thinking, oh, man, that is a bad place to be on the ground. And there was a deathly silence on the radio. Until an Army helicopter pilot came on, flying one of these things, a Chinook. And the pilot said, look, I've got the gas. I can get there. I'll go pick him up. I'm thinking, that, that's the size of a double-decker bus in London. It's got no guns. And you're going to fly that thing into the middle of a retreating Iraqi armor division to pick up one pilot. First time in my life I ever said, hooah. I was impressed. Shortly thereafter, we got a call saying that he'd been captured. They canceled the search and rescue effort. And that Chinook never had to make an attempt. That pilot never had to prove that they were really willing to do it. But I never forgot that radio call. And I'll never forget her voice. First time I told this story when we got back from the Gulf War, one of the people in the audience came up to me afterwards and says, I know who that was. I just got out of the Army. The only person it could have been is Major Marie Rossi. Next slide. She was the only combat certified aircraft commander in the United States Army at the time. So I went looking for her, and sure enough, he was right. It was Major Marie Rossi. And once I confirmed that was her name, I said, I'm going to go meet her. I want to tell her thank you because she was inspirational at a time when people needed it. It took me a little while to find her slide, but I did. Two days after the war ended, she and her crew were called out at 2 in the morning to pick up a soldier whose arms had been blown up by trying to pick up uh, weapons that were left in a, in a, a, from an airdrop, cluster munitions. She picked him up and was heading back to the base on the Saudi-Kuwait border when 
or the Saudi Iraq border, excuse me, when they hit an unlit, unlit uh, radio tower. The helicopter cr crashed and they were all killed. She lives here now in one of the newer sections of Arlington National Cemetery and I kept my promise. I went and met her. And I stood in front of that rock and thanked her for her courage, for her dedication, for the inspiration she gave so many of us that day, for her sacrifice, and the sacrifice of her husband and her young daughter. My son, Matt, who's still not a real touchy-feely kind of guy, when I told him this story, he goes, yeah, Dad, you must have felt pretty stupid standing there talking to that rock. <laughs> At attention, which I was. I don't know why. And I answered him, actually, not stupid. Just proud. You better be willing to make decisions. Because you're going to need to. And you're going to need to make them without all the information you'd like. And you're going to need to make them when people's lives are at stake. And you're not going to always have time to ask for somebody else to help you. Get ready. Next slide. When I was a wing commander at Kunsan, Korea, I was at a 4th of July picnic, and my chief master sergeant and I were standing there. We look up the sidewalk, and there's a guy walking toward us, and he's got black combat boots, black knee socks, cut-off jean shorts, no shirt. He's got nipple rings. He's got a chain between them, and the chain's connected to a black leather dog collar with big silver spikes on it, which matched the one on his wrist. He had the Hitler kind of haircut, goth black. So the chief and I went over and talked to him and gave him some fashion advice. <laughs> <laughs> which I'm sure he appreciated. <laughs> Turns out he was an F-16 crew chief, young staff sergeant, great guy, fantastic crew chief, I came to find out. I flew his airplane a lot. Every night, probably a couple of nights a week, I'd drive through the flight line and visit the guys out there. He was on the swing shift, which is the afternoon and evening shift, so I got to see him a bunch. I got to know him pretty well. We talked two or three times a week. Maybe six, seven months into my tour there, I get a knock on the, my door on Friday night late. I'm in the office doing paperwork. I look up, and here's this young staff sergeant. And with him is his tech sergeant supervisor, brand new to the wing, been there about four days. And he and the squadron commander, first sergeant chief, are all behind him looking not happy to be there. And this tech sergeant drug him in my office and he said, boss, you gotta fix this. And I'm thinking, God, he took his shirt off on the flight line, he had those nipple rings in. <laughs> <laughs> this is horrible. And then that young tech sergeant explained to me that wasn't the problem, this was the problem. His daughter, Lori who was four years old. The guy had left Hill Air Force Base in Utah to come to Korea. He'd gotten divorced right before he left because his wife was on drugs and he couldn't get her to stop using them. And after exhausting every other possibility, he divorced her. They had a custody battle for Lori. He didn't want his wife to get in trouble with the law, so he didn't mention the drugs. And she got custody of their daughter. Well, since then, she'd been arrested, charged, convicted of felony drug sales, and she was going to prison. Her only surviving relative and his only surviving relative was her mother, who had just gotten out of prison for drug sales. The judge had said, whoever gets custody is going to be close enough that I can see this little girl every six to eight weeks because I'm worried about her. So he can't compete because his follow-on assignment is to Spangdahl in Germany. So for the last six months, he'd been trying to work the Air Force assignment system on his own as a staff sergeant from Kunsan to get his assignment changed. You can imagine the kind of luck he was having. He's a very proud guy, he didn't want to ask for help. Well, after hearing the story, we kind of confirmed some facts. I called up the judge, talked to him. He agreed that at the final custody hearing, which was Monday, this is Friday night in Korea, he could compete if he was living closer. So I called a guy named Jimmy Green who ran the assignment system, good friend of Mike Gould's. He said, Jimmy, I need some help. I told him the story. Jimmy said, what do you want? I said, I want him to be assigned to Luke Air Force Base and I want him to be there Sunday. He said, okay, uh, put him on an airplane, the orders will meet him. So we did, a after we gave him a little advice about what you wear to a custody hearing in front of a judge, <laughs> and how to get a haircut between now and then. Anyway, I didn't hear anything else about this for a couple months, and uh, one Friday evening, again, I'm in the office, it's dark outside, I open up an envelope, I don't recognize the writing on, and, and this picture falls out. 
along with a note that just says, thank you. This is Lori at her fifth birthday party at an animal park up near Flagstaff, Arizona. I have full custody of her now. Pretty cool story, isn't it? Let me ask you a really important question. Why didn't I know about Lori? Saw the guy all the time. Talked to him a couple times a week. Why didn't I know he had a daughter? Any guesses? It's not complicated. I never asked him. I never asked him. I almost cost him his daughter. I almost cost her a family. By the way, so did his squadron commander, group commander, chiefs, first sergeants. None of us asked him. That young tech sergeant was leading this kid. Four days on a job, and he knew all about Lori. Folks, every airman has a story. Everybody in this room has a story. If you don't know the story, you can't lead the airman. It's that simple. Please learn the story. Next slide. We're going to expect you to be committed when you walk out the door. This is my command chief. His name's Dave Williamson. He's a pretty impressive guy. He's an explosive ordnance disposal technician. You can see he's wearing three specialty badges. He's got 36 ribbons on his chest and more, you know, stars and oak leaves than you can care to count here. He's been the distinguished graduate of every PME course he ever attended, including the U.S. Army's one-year Sergeant's Major Academy, where he was the distinguished graduate, the Commandant's Award winner, and won the Physical Fitness Award. Not normal for an Air Force guy in that environment. He's had 14 combat zone deployments. The last two is a command chief on one-year tours, and one in Afghanistan, one in Iraq. The previous 12 were all as an EOD technician or EOD team chief with Army and Marine Corps units in all the ugliest places you can imagine. This guy expects you to be committed to this profession. He expects you to be running as fast as you can when you hit the ground, because if you're not, he knows we will blow your doors off and leave you spinning on the side of the road, because that's what will happen. And he expects you to be ready to lead his airmen. In fact, he demands it. Airmen like this next guy. Slide. I'm going to show you a video of a retirement ceremony. I'm not going to say anything about it. It's a young staff sergeant. You guys will see hundreds of these in your career. Can we run this, Fred? I would like to thank the Air Force for giving me the honor and the privilege of carrying my country's flag forward into battle. It's a rare thing for a person to find a job and career. It gave them great, great joy. Every day, I loved coming to work. And after a short period of time, I gained a great sense of purpose in what I did. And uh, I think now that those days are coming to an end for me, I thought of what I'm gonna miss the most. This wonderful family. This great sense of purpose. I hope to take it with me and uh, wherever I go. Thank you. Mike, can I ask you and Betty to start walking up here to the side of the stage? Would you mind joining me for a minute here in just a second? I wasn't quite telling you the truth. This really isn't a retirement ceremony, it's an award ceremony. Next slide. For an Air Force Staff Sergeant named Matt Sladen. Matt's another EOD technician. You couldn't see very well in that picture because it's kind of a cheesy audio and a video. The first line, in case you didn't catch it, was, I want to thank my nation for the privilege of carrying its country, its, my flag into battle. What's impressive about that is the other stuff you couldn't see in that photo. You couldn't tell from that that Matt Sladen doesn't have a left arm. As a team chief, he was checking a bomb in Afghanistan, and as he took a look, he noticed the command detonation wire running off to the side. Something had felt wrong about it when he pulled up, and so he left the rest of the team in their van protected. 
He saw the command detonation wire had just enough time to stand and turn, which exposed his left side to the bomb when the coward with the, at the other end of the fuse set it off. His left arm was blown off instantly. His left eye was blown out. He had shrapnel on the entire left side of his body. He had third degree burns in his neck and face. His right eye was damaged beyond repair. He's blind. And he's saying things like that at an award ceremony. Are you ready to lead him? Next slide. Let me leave you with these words. Leadership is a gift. It's given by those who follow. But you have to be worthy of it. The men and women that you are going to be responsible for are the greatest people on the planet. You better be getting ready to lead them. If you're not, rededicate yourself to the effort. Try your leadership skills here. If you fail, learn and move on. Try again. That's what this environment's for. If you're still saying this place sucks, leave. We don't need you. We don't want you. Don't have time for you. Because when you leave this place, and I put you in, in command and supervision of people like Matt Sladen, if you let them down, I will track you down. And I will hurt you. And that's going to be really embarrassing considering how old I am. Is that fair? Guys, do you join me? Next slide, please, Fred. A few minutes ago, I told you about John Bosberg. Why don't you guys come out here with me? But I didn't tell you everything about him. Boss was my roommate here. He was my classmate in pilot training. He was my best friend. He's my brother-in-law, Betty's brother. He's the godfather of our first child. He's like the people sitting next to you. The bonds you form here will not end. Boss died November 28th, 1979. And after they found his remains off the coast of Korea, they shipped him to the west coast of the U.S. And I met him at the Oakland Army Depot to take him home to New York. And as I sat on top of his coffin in an empty supply hangar, waiting for a flight to New York, I made him a promise. I promised that every year, sometime in the month of November, I'd toast him with people I knew he'd respect. Well, this is November, and you qualify. Guys, if you'd come out here and join me, I'd appreciate it. He shall not grow old, as we who are left grow old. Age shall not weary him, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember. To John Vosberg, fighter pilot, classmate, my friend, and our brother. Thank you for the life you've chosen. Thanks for being good enough to be here. Make sure you're good enough to graduate. And take care of yourselves. I'll see you out there. You're dismissed. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for having me.